Greetings Grey Maniacs, Grey Maniacs Gather for another one of my videos and uh, I've combined this week, I've got the Monday uh, what I've read this week video and I've got the Tuesday unpacking because I actually got a package today. So that's cool. What's we? What's that? Oh, what's this? Oh, is it a wig? Do you think it looks like a wig? <laughs> Sorry, this is, a, this is something I'm doing later on actually. Um, I'm going to be the judge on Matilda and OG Space Bun's Origami Challenge. And I don't know if you're aware of the court system in the UK, but judges always wear wigs in our UK court system. So I've just like dug out a few wigs to wear on Matilda's uh, stream later on. <laughs> if you missed it, which is, this is going to be coming out after that, but if you missed it, you may want to go back and watch it. It's on Matilda Gothica's channel. It's her Origami Challenge with her and OG Space Bun's folding paper. Right, so first let's do the reads of the week. Strange Adventures. Quite like these, I'll pick them up when I can see them, but I don't see them that often. First of all, it's a new Atomic Knight story where the girl, the lady Atomic Knight, dresses as a, as a young boy to try and entice these feral kids away from being feral and attacking villages to steal food and stuff. So she manages, and um, the bad guys, they're kind of like Nazis, but not said to call them Nazis, they're called like black. It's, so sort of like black shirts or something like that, which is which were the Nazis in the UK. They were called the black shirts, weren't they? Um, led by Enoch Powell and all that. They're called blue belts. They're called blue belts in this, and you can see by their insignia and their clothing that they're obviously Nazi. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that. I'm probably going to get demonetised for saying that. <laughs> I, bet, I hope not. So yeah, she, she just as a boy manages to um, convince the boys to... Because uh, the, the blue belts try and take them over and, and force them to become their soldiers. And uh, they, the Atomic Knights are able to uh, capture the blue belts and stop them from doing it. And the, the lads decide to join the uh, Atomic Knights civilization, even though it means they have to go to school and all that. But at least they'll get regular meals and won't get, won't get sucked in by the blue belts again. And, uh, you know, forced to join their nefarious army. And then we got this one story, Captive of the Eclipse. I don't know if these are all original stories or reprints, actually, some of these stories. I'm not too sure. I think they're originals. But this was a weird one where a guy wants to create a... Um, a ray or aura that will make people c help to cure people and he does it um, like an eclipse comes and it, that spreads the aura to people and they all think oh we're getting better we're, we're going to be fine but it turns out he hadn't perfected it and the very next time the next day the sun rose everyone was going to get killed who, who'd got the aura uh, but for some reason they were convinced it was it was great and they wouldn't listen to any anything negative about it so the scientist uh, has to try and stop the machine that's going to create the eclipse to come again and kill them all uh, but he has to sort of fight against them to be able to save them kind of thing so it's a bit of a <laughs> bit of an interesting story but like this one I remember having this as a kid and I don't know what happened to it but I remember buying this from the news agents around a corner from my dad's house just to, I'm not sure if they ever had any more stories to be honest it was, it was only their only ever appearance I'm not too sure but it was the green team I remember buying it as a kid and I saw it going cheap it was like 9.2 grey, they were saying. 9.2, like, I really didn't care if it was in, it is in good condition, but it's hardly important. But it's a first issue special number two. And I've got a, fair, a few of those first issue specials. There's one on the back here as well, actually. But uh, I read that one before, so I'm not going to tell you about that one. It was a quite good story as well, though. But yeah, basically, the, the group of rich, three rich kids and the guy is a shoeshine boy, and he ends up making a million <laughs> and joining this green team of boy millionaires. We're looking for, looking for adventure. And there's a shipping magnate, an oil magnate and a film uh, guy and uh, they, they, they basically look for adventures and people give them ideas things to invest in and they some guy makes up something called the pleasure dome that he wants to create which was like you know they're all, yeah we like some pleasure some some you know so he's making this dome but there's all these entertainers got like a union of entertainers who try and fight against it because they don't want to be like no if you have this pleasure dome people won't come to us for entertainment that kind of thing but the leader of them uh, he tries to basically just tries to bribe them to blackmail them so if you don't 
give me some money, I'll get these people to stop your dome kind of thing. And you end up the the the, the reunion leader guy he goes into the dome, he's in there for like three days and he comes out, he's mad, he's been like overcome with pleasure kind of thing. <laughs> so that was uh, nice and dark. But this is, the, this is, I wasn't sure if it was the first appearance, but it's not, it's the second appearance, I believe, of Nightmaster. And this is the, the, the denouement of the story. His, his uh, girlfriend is captured by some evil wizard. They go to a, a hermit kind of um, mystic uh, who assists them. Uh, his girlfriend gets changed um, into like so she doesn't look like herself like an illusion of somebody else and she's convinced maybe made to convince that the night master is evil and so she she wants to kill him kind of thing but in the end they managed to get managed to defeat the uh, the villains and get back to their own world kind of thing they've been sucked into a, a new world It'd be nice to get the first part of that one just so I've got the, the pair I don't know if they have, I know he appeared uh, later on in um, uh, the Shadow Pact he was a member of Shadow Pact but whether he had any profile anywhere else like when I think when I saw him in Shadow Pact I can't see he was a character I remembered right I've got a journey into mystery here great cover on this one these are nice uh, reprint stories all good stuff so Kiss of Death what happened in this one oh yeah this right uh, a writer husband getting on a little bit a younger wife uh, he's got a bit of a writing block she kind of wants to be rid of him because uh, he's not making the money that she thought she, he would make. Uh, he's got this writing block. She try, she, she knows that he's got a dodgy ticker. So she tries to scare him to death by dressing up as a vampire. Uh, it doesn't work. But then a vampire does visit him in the night and bites his neck. And then next time she comes in determined to, to scare him to death by being a vampire, pretending to be a vampire, he actually bites her neck and gives her the kiss of death at the end there. So, yeah. Uh, mm. Right, the genie lives. This is a story that never happened. This is what it says here. Ever read a story without an ending? Well, this one might be a tale like that. The only thing is, we can't be sure. So he, he unleashes a genie and starts making wishes, thinking, "What can I? What happens if I want this? What happens if I want that?" And then it turns out, he, you know, he makes silly wishes that like ends up with him. You know, he wants everything to go back to normal. So he says, Don't bring everything back to normal. Make the world as it was before I ever saw you. So he goes back to the beginning. And he's back to before the point where he finds the spell that makes the genie come out. So basically, he's going to repeat himself again. And probably do very much the same things. Who knows? Okay, this one's called The Question. This guy's made a robot brain that can predict the future. And he asks... He's not supposed to use it for his own ends, but he couldn't help himself. Because he loves his wife so much. He, you know, wanted to see, check, you know, she'll be all right when he's gone. And when we so sort of ask, when will we die, kind of thing. When will I die? When will she die? Um, and it kind of like, it, there's a, a, like a gap between answers kind of thing. So first off, when he, he asks, how does, you know, he, he waits for the answer to the first question. When will she die? And it says she's going to die at midnight. So he goes running back home to try and save her. From, from being murdered or dying, whatever it is that causes it to die. And he's sort of like, he also asks, when will I die? But he doesn't get time to listen to that answer. And he gets home, finds his missus in the arms of another man, accidentally kills her. And uh, then he you see him leaning over a body saying, my life is, life is now meaningless. And then he goes back to the, the brain in the laboratory and he says, question two, answer. Paul Jessup will die at three minutes after midnight tonight. Suicide. So there you go. That's what happened. <laughs> well, this one's called Hide and Shriek. Um, yeah, this guy keeps playing tricks on people. He's a prankster. And for some reason... Oh, some a witch doctor from the past who he's, who he's um, basically did a prank on and ended up leading him to being, him being killed, I think, or him getting the blame. And so he's tracked him down and he plays a trick on him whereby... He's playing hide and seek at the time with his housemates, his house guests. And they, he says, if you can't find them before the morning, you'll disappear or you'll never be seen again or something like that. And he can't find anyone in the house and it ends up him just disappearing. So, it must be a joke. It must be. Where is everybody? A minute later, from every corner of the house, all the people come up. And they say, he made us all black out, lose consciousness, even the servants. Find him, search the whole house. So they searched the house, they searched all night, the police searched all day. But George Carras, poor fellow, he may never be found again. So yeah, he was made to disappear by this voodoo guy as a recompense for messing with the, with the guy and getting him the blame for stealing something that he never stole kind of thing. Uh, and getting him outcast from his people. 
It's there, and it's uh, one of those uh, tropes that come up a lot. Don't play tricks on people because they may come back and bite you in the ass. Right, here's another cool one. No, actually, no, yeah, these are all reprints. I think I said that already. I actually looked up the, what, the, what this one was a reprint of kind of thing. I don't know what maybe prompted me to want to look it up. It actually didn't have it right in here as well. It says something like it was in, from so-and-so number 70. But when I looked it up, it wasn't in that one. So I had to do a little bit of research to find out which one it actually was in. Right, you know, this one is When Wakes the Sphinx. There's a couple of Egyptian guys looking up at the Sphinx and it's um, ascertained that the Sphinx is really a creature hiding under the stone that's been put there to protect the earth if needs be. And they're all, one of them's like, oh yeah, what a load of nonsense. And then aliens come, <laughs> the Sphinx comes to life, scares off the aliens, and the bloke's like, hmm, maybe it's not nonsense after all. <laughs> Which it obviously wasn't because the Sphinx was alive. Right, the thing on the moon. Right, this is, I love this one. This is from Strange Tower. I think this is why I looked it up. So Strange Tower 77. I want to look up what it was from. But it wasn't from Strange Tower 77. So I wanted to look for it. And it wasn't. It was like 72 or something like that. And, uh, but what I love about this is it's stories written a long time ago, prophesizing the future, which is now well into our past kind of thing. So like it was a story written in about 1960 or late 50s. And it was talking about the time is 1990. The planet Earth has a problem, overpopulation. Something must be done about it. <laughs> and uh, they don't know anything about the moon. We know there are no living creatures on the moon, but we don't know about the climate and terrain. <laughs> we have to find out if it's fit for humans. So in this, in this story reality, the first humans go to the moon in 1990. <laughs> so 1969, when we actually did go to the moon, they didn't know anything about that, of course. So this is a, I, I love that. It's, it's so anachronistically wrong. <laughs> and when they get to the moon, there's a giant uh, monster there, which turns out to be a robot created by the um, Atlanteans. So when the Atlantis was abandoned, they went off into space and they left this robot on the moon to say this, this, this planet belongs to the Atlantis you know, don't don't come to what come don't come here. It belongs to us. <laughs> so they leave the moon. <laughs> Funny though, Atlantis. I'll say that again. Funny though about Atlantis. I wonder what happened to it. Will we ever hear from them again in a universe big and this big and strange? Who can tell? Who can tell? Yeah, I really read that badly. I hate you when I do that. Right, then we've got a story called It Came From Nowhere, which is quite a good premise. It's like it's a black pool outside his house, which eats everything that like touches it. And when it eats it, it grows bigger. Um, this poor sheriff put his finger in it and it burnt off, which is uh, clumsy of him. And he starts studying it kind of thing. And he realises that when it eats something, it gets bigger. So it's obviously dangerous. And then he actually spills it in the sink. It knocks one of the ones down the sink. Um... And he knows that if he gets into the sea, you know, it could carry on eating and growing and you know never stop. So he puts his hand in to block it from going down the drain, and he gets his hand almost eaten off uh, before he can. And then he soaks that up with a sponge, which I thought that's going to get it all over your hands. It's what the guy soaks up with a sponge, and it's like, well, you get your hands on the sponge. You need to be wearing gloves at the very least, so it doesn't get through to you. Uh, the other guy shouldn't have bloody will such dangerous stuff. Shouldn't have left it by the sink in an open container either. But there you go. But anyway, it turns out, um, I can't remember the exactly, and it turns out they were like aliens. Aliens had landed on Earth, and when they landed, they melted because it was too hot for their life forms. But this liquid that they turned into uh, was what was this stuff was, and it was eating the people. But apparently, um, yeah, they had a second ship that had melted and was already in the ocean, so the guy left his hand trying to stop it from getting in the ocean, little realising that it had already got into the ocean. So basically it's going to grow and grow in the ocean, feeding on fish and so forth, whales, and it clicks more and more and more, and eventually it's going to destroy the whole planet, isn't it? Unless they find a way to stop it. Right, if looks could kill is the next story. I can't remember what happened this one. Um, oh yeah, there's a beautiful woman. I think she's leading some fella on. He's a professor. And he, that's right, and he's leading her on. She, she's leading him on because she wants his money or whatever. And she's, you know, she's just treating him like a doormat and eventually he has enough of it i think he finds out that he hears her admitting it and she's got a, a she's got a lover you know she's not interested in him at all despite the fact he worships the ground he walks she walks on and so he, he gets to the country he's laboratory so i think he promises her some money or some no he promises her some cream that's going to make her yet look young or forever kind of thing so she goes there to put this cream on and it makes her young forever but it turns her into like a a solid basalt stone 
So basically turns her into a statue of herself. So she's frozen forever, but her beauty will forever be retained. <laughs> Albeit as a statue. So yeah. That's what you got to learn these things. Don't cheat on your man in because you might end up being in a journey into a mystery story and end up being uh, killed or uh, turned into a statue or other such unpleasantness. Right, number 16. Relax, darling. There's nothing here to be afraid of. Death lurks within the mummy case. Love the covers on these as well. Such great covers. The man who said no. Oh, this is a guy who he's just a, a bit of a bit of a um, industrialist, uh, greedy, you know, big wig. Uh, he takes great pride. He's got this this ant out here. He likes when the ants get stuff. He likes to flick them off down again. He's like to, to keep things. You know, he's got obviously got a bit of a complex. He likes to say no to people. His guy, his scientists, asks him for some. Um, funding for his experiment and he's like no go away and then he thinks you're going to go and visit him so he can pretend that he that he's going to say yes and then he just want to say so just so he can say no again because he likes the look of people's faces when he when he breaks their dreams kind of thing but we're not all realizing that the guy's experiment is to do with size changing so he he um gets shrunk down to nothing and he's climbing up a little ant hill kind of thing and there's this little boy he just, every time he gets to the top he flicks him down again so he's like learning his He's learning his lesson. <laughs> uh, right, Ragdoll. This is an interesting one. The Ragdoll. Uh, the guy's dad's died and his money's missing. He doesn't know where his money is because he, he like, kept it hidden in the house. So the guy is upset because he couldn't find his, his money, the money and he wants to leave everything behind, uh, including this Ragdoll that, that he's got. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I think it was his grandmother. Or grand or granddad, and she belongs to his daughter, and he just no leave it behind. We don't want that. You know, we will make a clean break of everything. Everything here can be left behind, and then it keeps coming back. The rag doll keeps reappearing, but rather than being an evil rag doll, somehow it's actually a like a, a good benevolent magic rag doll because it turns out that the money was stuffed inside the rag doll all along. So yeah, their financial woes are over, and uh, the little girl gets to keep her rag doll. <laughs> Mind you, her dad was a bit of a twit for not letting her keep the ragdoll in the first place. So there you go. Right, this is an interesting one. The old man's secret. This guy wants to get the secret of immortality. So he goes to like a, a Tibet or something like that, way out in the sticks. He has to like a dangerous journey for the snow to get there. He finds the old man uh, and his son. Uh, well, the, 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 the guy with the secret. Say it's the guy with the secret of eternal life and his son. He finds them in uh, this you know, remote Tibetan place. He, and he picks the old man up and he convinces the young man to, to let him take him with him. Uh, he says, let me take him with me, um, you know, because you can't, you're, you haven't got the, the facilities here. I'll look after him for you, you know, save, save you the, the hassle. And so he gets him back thinking, oh yes, I've got the old man. He has the secret of the the meaning of life, you know, how to you know live forever kind of thing. But he's got it all wrong. The young man was the guy who's got the secret to eternal life. And the old man was his son, who has now become old. So yeah, so I suppose it doesn't make an awful lot of sense really, because it's like if he knew the secret to eternal life, why didn't he give it to his son? So his son didn't become an old man and, uh, <laughs> and you know, get infirm and be about to die kind of thing. But uh, anyway, it was a cool, cool enough story. I didn't see the, the twist on that one, so I was quite happy with that. Right, the thing in the jungle. What's up? Wana, my people much frightened. They never come so deep in jungle before. They want to turn back Wana. They do? Then when, <laughs> uh, Right, they're looking for a lost temple. That's right, yeah, they're looking for a lost temple. And it turns out that um, this explorer is trying to find this lost temple. When he gets there, three other guys have found it as well. And then they find there's a spaceship there. And he says, oh, when we crashed on Earth, we sent you four, you know, people from this craft to different parts of the Earth and, take, and sort of hid your memory so you forgot that you were aliens. And uh, But you only had this call to come to this temple, to find this temple, because, you know, that was so you could get back to the ship kind of thing. Uh, I'm going by memory here, but it turns out the guy who we whose story we first uh, saw, 
he's he isn't an alien. So he's like, oh, I am a human, but I just want to come here because I want to discover the temple. But now these other guys are actually aliens and they're going to get back on the ship. What do I do? He says, what's my move? Tell them or tag along? And he just finishes, what would your move be if you were Cliff Morgan? So yeah, he's now discovered that he's in there with some aliens. Well, right, here's the head, the head story inside the mummy case. Uh, the mummy... Oh, that's right. So this... this um guard in the museum this voice from the mummy's um sarcophagus keeps telling him to push a button on his sarcophagus because there's money or jewels in there or something like that. probably jewel i think it was a jewel and the the curators sort of say no don't go there don't touch it don't listen to the the voice from inside the, the sarcophagus but yeah and he ends up wrestling with him and in the fight the button is accidentally pressed but not not with someone standing over it and then a dagger comes flying out and smashes into the ceiling. So if he had grabbed that button, touched that button, it would have he would have been shot through with a dagger. So the curator was basically saving his life. Not quite sure why the the uh, the dead mummy inside that sarcophagi was wanting to kill uh, living people, but uh, yeah, he didn't manage it. Right, a nice old Captain America. Target the trapster. I love the the dialogue of the trapster in this one. He's talking like he's some big big cheese of the, in the super villain world, like real megalomania kind of uh, dialogue for someone who just like fires some some glue <laughs> and has never been has never you know maybe when he first came along maybe he he was considered a big wig but even he was called the trapster so I don't know when he was known as Pink Pot Pete. But surely as Paint Pot Pete, he couldn't have thought of himself as being a, a as an arch villain, more of a nuisance. Mind you, you think he would be more dangerous. He's quite quite a lot of this super glue that you can't get off of. But anyway, it turns out the glue that's in this, um, luckily for, super, for Captain America, he's able to break out of it. It's brittle and it keeps breaking. But what's happened? He's going to save uh, his, is it Peggy Carter? Uh, and um, Or oh, Sharon Carter, no, Sharon Carter, I think. He's going to save her, and uh, it turned out she wasn't really captive after all. It was an LMD, a life model decoy that was tied to the table by the trapster, and she was actually behind the scenes messing with his his uh, glue gun formula. So that's how Captain America was able to break out of it, kind of thing. Uh, right, there's another Captain America. This one has gone behind bars to um, uh, test the... the prison system because there was the, the governor of the prison is afraid that it's um it's too easy to break out of there's been like some suspicion that it might be you know too easy to break out of and basically he goes in there to try and break out of it just to test the system he has run-ins with various uh, prisoners and including one prisoner who he ascertains doesn't deserve to be uh, you know locked up forever kind of thing because he's a he's you know he's had a few bad breaks and he doesn't deserve to be locked up for good kind of thing right number 149 avengers uh i've got two more to go in my avengers my proposed avengers run um number 150 is it 150 or 151 i can't remember now and 183 they're both getting up there a little bit in price like 20 pound 10 pound something like that so well i'll get them soon one day eventually uh, yeah, so this one is fighting against Orca, the, the killer whale guy, and uh, he's been made bigger. Um, Moon Dragon is in his ear. Oh, you're a god. We're both gods. We're better than the rest of the Avengers. Why are we messing? Why are you wasting your time with them? You should be with me or something like that. She's basically being a pain in his butt, and um, but eventually she he, he realizes yes, I am a god. You know, I am. You know. I am tougher than the rest of the Avengers, and this Orca has got nothing on me, kind of thing. I've been holding back because I don't want to harm mortals, and he uses his thunder and he takes him out, basically. Right, a couple of Avengers Spotlight. Got a few more of these to go to finish my run. Not too many, though. Uh, the lead story um, there's like a gang, there's like a couple of Latino, I think, gangs. And uh, there's a guy called the Terminizer, it's the stupidest name ever, who's been taking out members of one of the gang. And, uh, yeah, he's trying to, to deal with that, basically. And then in the US agent story, there's a guy who's um, got a mad on against immigration and he basically going around killing Mexican immigrants. And he's actually a border guard, it turns out. He's actually a border guard with really dodgy um, raison d'etre for why he's doing it. I can't remember. Someone got killed by an, an immigrant, maybe. And also he had a, he had a girlfriend of... Latino heritage who dumped him 
<laughs> it was like, fucking hell, move on, dude, move on. You haven't got to bring in wipe out, kill people, just because you've been thinking, you know, a lady decides she doesn't want to be with you anymore. Anyway, and these are just a continuation of both those stories, the, the, the final parts of both those stories uh, in this one. Uh, right, Avenger Spotlight, this whole story is just Gilgamesh fighting against some dragon lord that he'd previously defeated. Yeah. No great shakes, but a good enough little story. Well, I got one and two of this nightmares. Two stories in it. Uh, the first story on this cover is um, this town where a satanic orgy was taking place two hundred years ago. They were they were executed by the authorities, but the they're, they're supposed to be coming back. This guy who was the head of the coven is creating another kind of like bacchanalia there. And at midnight, when the twelfth strike of the bell goes, then all the people who are there carousing will be will be inhabited by the souls of those who were executed two hundred years ago, kind of thing. And this guy has come there for a story, uh, a newspaper story, and he's got a, a lady there that he's um, hot for, and he's trying to uh, to rescue her and stop the. Uh, the, the satanic horde, whatever, from coming and possessing everybody. And in the second backup story, which is shown on this cover, there's um, like a deep south, I'm guessing, from the what it looked like. It's like a, in, in the south, there's a house out in the countryside on its, in its own grounds where like a rich guy lives with a couple of psychotic security guards. Uh, he's a bit mad and it turns there's another guy there who they've captured and it, and they're like, it looked like going to execute him. But he was there saying, look, you must move out. You shouldn't be in this house. This was a place where we used to dump nuclear waste. There's all this nuclear waste buried underground here. It's, it's killing you. And the guy who's who's the man of the house is a bit loopy. And he's got skin cancer. You can see he's got lesions. The doctor there was another character who'd been brought into it by by the the man who lives there's wife. And she her son is a, a twisted... Um, a deformed baby because of the radiation in the air. Uh, husband is dying and crazy because the he's been irradiated and, and he's cancerous. But uh, basically, it's them wanting to escape, so he, he wants to get free with the woman. The guy who was there, who was there dumping nuclear radiation in the past, he ends up burning that place down. The two crim- crim- like psychotic guards both get killed. One gets ripped apart by alligators. I can't remember how the other one bought it. I think he gets shot by by the doc by the doctor there. Um, but yeah, they end up getting away from the burning house. The, I think the baby dies in the house as well in the fire. Um, yeah. Oh, and in the other story, he's unsuccessful. But I think he thinks he's successful. He's unsuccessful in, in stopping the, the spirits from t- taking over everybody. And... Yeah, and it turns out that the woman that he's um, trying to get out, she's one of the ones who's overtaken. So he, she says, oh, let's go to London. And she's like, she's making implications that they're going to have some sexy time when they get there kind of thing. And um, it's all about spreading spreading the evil. So she's like, at the end, because you, you think yourself for a second, oh, he managed to do it. And at the end, he goes, ah, our f- the first of our emissaries is on their way to London kind of thing. So, you know, oh, so she is one of them. She's pretending she's not, but she's one of them. Right, I've started on a big batch of Lois and uh, Jimmy's that I uh, bought a while back. Loads of different stories. There's about four different stories in every single one. It's the it's, This is from 1960. This one's in Bad Nick. But it's the usual um, crazy storylines. Lois misbehaving. Lois being clumsy. Wanting Superman to marry her. Superman doesn't want to marry her because she'll be in danger all the time. And this... Right, and just like crazy stories from there, really. I want that will be careful. With. Right, this first one, Lois Lane. She she reasons that if she lives in in the fortress of solitude, no enemies will be able to get to her. So she's like, ah, I can if I can convince Superman, you know, it's good for me to stay here, and I'm and I'm safe. Then he'll he he got no excuse not to marry me, kind of thing. But he realizes her plot. She makes a machination, so she has to stay in the in the fortress by going into this telescope, which is gonna make her die she, if she sees sunlight. So he shuts the windows and keeps her there for three days. But he engineers it so that she she doesn't have a smooth ride of it. Uh, she ends up getting spanked by a Superman robot under the machinations of Superman. 
<laughs> you had all kinds of kinkiness there. You wouldn't get away with absolute malarkey nowadays, I'm sure, unless it was like through by consenting adults. <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing, I can imagine if there's any, if there's any, is there any uh, readers in them days, as as you know, young readers in them days, how they might have thought, ooh, ooh, it might, it might have sparked a few, a few kinks in later life. Who knows? But there she is, getting uh, thoroughly spanked. By, by Superman robot, and uh, in the next picture she can't sit down. So she's eating her dinner standing up because her, her bottom hurts. <laughs> mm, ooh, yeah, and then she gets attacked by uh, one of the uh, one of the aliens that are in there. She gets menaced by it. It's and then you get the the reveal that it was all a all a blinking hoax. Oh, and she's also there was a um. She finds out some Christmas presents that he's going to be giving to people, and he finds she finds two of LL, and one says to you know, friend of Superman, Happy Christmas. And the other one says, Oh, to the only woman who knows my secret identity, and so Lois is spending the rest of the like up to Christmas wondering if it's her or Lana who's going to get the one saying the person who knows my secret identity, and uh, it turns out it's not. It's Linda Lee, LL Linda Lee, which is Supergirl's I don't know, um, alias. So yeah, just Superman's a bit, basically Superman being a dick, as uh, as many people know. Right, and this one I've read before, Lois Lane's Soldier Sweetheart. She makes out that she's being, she's going to marry this this geeky little soldier guy, but she's behaving behind his back like a right cow, and like basically admitting that she's oh she doesn't care about him. His dad's a a TV produ- a, a film producer. I'm only pretending to be with him so I can get noticed by his film producer father, and you know he can put me in films and make me famous. And um, Clark is fooled by it, and all the soldier powers of this guy, are, are, you know, are fooled by it. Because he's not, she's not trying to hide it. She's making it obvious, and they're all sort of selling him. And he's saying, "No, I don't believe. I don't believe it." Uh, you know, she loves me. We're going to get married. She, he proposes. She says yes. Then she jilts him at the altar. And then he pretends he's about to commit suicide by crashing a helicopter. A uh, Superman saves him, and then it turns out it was all a plot from the soldier boy and Lois to prove to his father that he can act. So he's like, he's fooled them all. In, you know. Just so because he wants to get in his father's films, his father said he can't act, and he, you know, so he, he's proven that he can act <laughs> by doing all this uh, machinations, all this silliness. Right, and the next story is the I think it's only three stories. It's the st- cover story where, for a moment, she's wearing um, the Batgirl costume and pretending that she's marrying. She's gonna marry Batman. <laughs> uh, but wait, right, so Supergirl wants Lois and Clark, Lois and Superman to marry, so they can adopt her, so she's not in the orphanage anymore. So she's trying to wrangle some machination against Superman to make him think that he loves her. But he, she keeps like he's driving down the road, and she keeps painting Lois's pictures on the billboards. And when he does a double take, she blows the paint off, so she so it's back to normal. And so he thinks to himself, "I'm seeing Lois everywhere. I must be in love with her." And um, but every every time, a couple of times, he tries to do to this stuff that backfires. So he's, he's about to propose, and uh, and it backfires on her because she does something. She, she for example, at one point she wanted Superman to uh, her to be in, Lois to be in Superman's arms, so she blows. The, to try and make him stumble onto her or the other way around so they're in each other's arms but instead she goes over the side of the ship and another time she tries to use his post-hypnotic suggestion to make him propose but he ends up proposing to loads of different women because he just said propose and didn't say propose to Lois just says propose but then it turns out that he's already sussed the uh, the plot because yeah, yeah, that's at the same point she sends a, a Batgirl costume to her with a, a fake note from Batman saying, oh, marry me. And Lois Scott plays along because she wants to make Superman jealous. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so it all turns out uh, right in the end, I suppose. I suppose you could call it all turning out right in the end. They still don't want to get married anytime soon. <laughs> Nobody dies, I suppose. <laughs> that's the main thing. No one dies. Nothing gets blown up. So, yeah, I suppose you call that a win. <laughs> Superman outsmarts uh, Supergirl. Lois still isn't going to get married to the man she loves. But uh, it happens eventually. It happens eventually. But in this Silver Age, they had to 
to, to go with this kind of crazy shenanigans. I'd love to get a golden age Superman at some point, just so I can see how the, how even wackier, if they get much wackier than they do in the Silver Age, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I think the Silver Age might have been wackier than the Golden Age. I think the Golden Age were more, I don't know, possibly a little, a little bit more violent. I'm not too sure. They were before the comics code. So, um, you know, I hear they used to kill people back in the day. I'm not too sure. Uh, I know Batman is, has. Right, and then the, this is the last comic that I read this morning, number, Lois Lane number 16. Love the covers and all the Lois and Jimmy's, most of them are super. And this, uh, once again, uh, this is the Kryptonite Girl story. Lois has, mis has, has um, misbehaved. She's, she's touched some item that Superman's told her not to touch. It's given her Kryptonite vision. vision. So when, as soon as he looks at her, uh, it's going to kill her. Got to kill Superman rather or hurt Superman. It turns out, once again, another dick move from Superman. He knew that she wouldn't be able to resist. So he knew that she was going to touch it. And the green kryptonite rays were just green rays. They weren't actually kryptonite, so they weren't hurting him at all. But he wanted to teach her a lesson for some reason. <laughs> other than, I'm sure there's another reason other than just the fact that he's a dick. <laughs> I can't think of it right at the top of my head. And then they've got this story, Lois Lane's signal watch. So she gets a signal watch like, like Jimmy's. And, uh, yeah, as they always play her in the Silver Age, she's a bit ditzy and impulsive, and she, she calls Superman for things like breaking her heel. Uh, there's a dog chasing a cat, so she calls Superman. Like, silly little things. And um, so he's getting teed off of it slightly. And then eventually, she he sort of, like, has a little... Uh, she calls him when she has a nightmare one time. And eventually gets a little bit teed off. He's like, "Stop calling me for no for no good reason. Uh, only call me for good reasons." And uh, some villains hear that and capture her, and they want her to call him just at the same time as they're doing a robbery, so that um, you know it will uh, distract him from the robbery. Um, but he manages to, to get both of them, and he says, "Lois, why didn't you signal me for my help with the watch I gave you? You could have been killed by a deadly bomb." And she's got a tear in her eye. I was afraid to call you. After all, only the life of a pest was at stake. What kind of a dire emergency is that? My life means nothing to you. <laughs> there you go. I don't want it. Take it back. I don't want a guy an angel who thinks I'm a nuisance. <laughs> so there you are. Uh, so she says she'd rather have no signal watch at all than have Superman constantly annoyed with her. But then it's like, well, don't keep calling it for silly things then, Lois. You're not daft. <laughs> You're not daft like you're portrayed in these comic books. <laughs> there you go. This is a different time. What can you say? A different time. You could be, you know, different characters. Before before there was the uh, uh, crisis on the infinite earth and she was portrayed as a, a proper intelligent woman. She's, she, she has some good moments in, in these. She's not always... But when it comes to her love for Superman, it's always done very sillyly and she is played as impulsive and reckless that kind of thing so Superman can always be rescuing her right this one the mystery of Skull Island they're undercover to do get a story on this um, horror movie actor and his wife um, and Lois starts to suspect that this horror movie actor has killed her, her his wife who was an heiress and he from the looks of it he has because he, he's covering up the fact that she's pretending that she's alive or no, and that she's actually there when she's not he's like putting on lipstick and putting it on a cup so it looks like she's been eating in her room. Yeah, she's, so he's saying that she's in her room all the time and he's got a, a dummy that he's using to, out on the patio uh, to make it look like she's there, that kind of thing. And Lois suspects. Uh, but it turns out in the end that it wasn't him, but he was doing this to try and to flush out the person who actually did kill his wife on the yacht when they were coming back from their vacation in Europe kind of thing. And uh, she ends up getting... Because she pretends... She, she wants to sort of force him to admit it, so she dresses up as his wife, um, to pretend to be a ghost, and she gets pushed over the balcony. Okay, well, that was annoying. My camera cut out because it ran out of memory. I didn't even realise it until about... I've been talking for another five minutes, and uh, it's only turned itself off. Uh, that is annoying. <laughs> Normally it flashes up with a warning. So, yeah, um, yeah. so she gets thrown off a balcony, but Superman saves her. And it turns out he knew that the guy hadn't killed his wife because he read his diary while it was locked in the safe. Uh, right, and then we've got the final story on this one with the the, the cover story. Um, as I say, Superman tr 
get, puts out this this stuff. Told us not to touch it. She touches it anyway because she's impetuous like that and uh, naughty. <laughs> you call it naughty other than reckless. Um, she ends up getting this kryptonite vision, but it turns out in the end she never really had kryptonite vision at all. All it was was green beams coming in through her eyes. The Superman pretended it was kryptonite and pretended to be all weak by it because he wanted to partly teach her a lesson maybe and also just to, to try and stop her from thinking that he was superman and clark kent at the same time so um she ends up going to alaska for a while living with the eskimos to keep away from superman then superman comes in saying he's got an antidote for her um uh, and but it's a nice clark and jimmy who come to say they've got an antidote and she uses her green beams on clark kent because she thinks oh i wonder if he is superman if i put my green beams on him and he gets weak i know that he really is superman all along and he shows no reaction to it so she's like oh well it can't be, he can't be superman then um but really he knew it, it, that he was going to get but all his say so it only gave her great green beam eyes but never actually uh it wasn't actually kryptonite vision at all so she was made to she was made sad and made to live out with the Eskimos for a while so Superman could uh, try and stop her from believing that he was Clark Kent. <laughs> yeah, just um, as uh, Matilda would call it and most people, Superman being a dick. Well, I actually went through some of most of these comics before my buddy Cam was shot out and that's when I realised it was... Um uh, that's when I realised it stopped filming. Actually, lucky you did because I I didn't realise what the time was. I completely run, completely lost track of time, and um, I was supposed to have been doing Matilda's origami show with her and Space Buns, OG Space Buns, and I completely missed it. Completely and utterly missed it. What an idiot! I I just didn't keep track of the time. I thought I had more a lot more time than I did. So it's lucky the battery did run out. Otherwise, I would have been even later into the stream than I already was. I was already embarrassingly late. <laughs> well, let's put these back into order. Well, I'm going to um, have a word with the uh, the seller, see if I could get him to give me a refund on some of the postage. Because to be honest, it was a bit on the... I think it was a little bit on the ridiculous side because it, he charged me over £10 for postage and it only cost £4.20 to send. So he's like £6 for the envelope and his time. No, I don't think so. So I'm going to knock off a few stars from the postage rating... Uh, for every quid over which I over the price that I think it should have been you know and so it was, it was £4.20 I reckon it shouldn't, have, it shouldn't have charged me more than £6 maybe £6.50 you know that would have been I could have lived with that £3 over a touch at the most but six double double what I actually you know not, not on anyway let me show you so basically it's a batch of Jimmy's another batch of Jimmy's to delight and uh, amuse Matilda Goffaker with. The dummy that haunted Jimmy Olsen. This is number 67. Uh, a lot of low-grade ones, but you know me. Low-grade all the way. Mr. Vero, that dummy of me you're using in your Superman Olsen ventriloquism act. He's alive and menacing me. Stop him. Don't waste your breath, Olsen. I'm going to finish you and take over your identity. He's telling the truth, Jimmy. You'd better summon the real Superman to save you. I don't know if Roger's going to be watching this one uh, this week, but um, I was saying that there's a there was a character in a a Marvel comic that I read recently. I think it was Spider. No, it was Captain America. Captain America. It was actually this one. It was actually this Captain America that I showed you earlier on. There's a a, a character who's a reporter, and to, from my mind, he's meant to be Jimmy Olsen because he's wearing Jimmy Olsen's green plaid jacket. His hair colour's not the same, but he, he says, oh, I must get this information to the chief or something like that, he says at one point. And I'm pretty sure it was a, a, an homage to Jimmy <laughs> or a parody of, of Jimmy. Right. Uh, number 69. I don't think this is the first appearance. I, I doubt this is the first appearance of Flamebird and Nightwing. It might be, though. Ha! So Flamebird is Jimmy Olsen and Nightwing is Superman. Now that I know your secret, I'll become King of Candor. Nightbird, how can we fight this evil imposter when he has superpowers and you have none? Why is he calling him Nightbird when he's just been called Nightwing a second ago? Did he forget what he was supposed to be called <laughs> in the space of his own cover? Uh, the dynamic duo of Kandor. Hmm. See, Flamebird Olsen and Nightwing Superman battle a super outlaw with their wits and utility belts. And of course, Nightwing, Robin became Nightwing later on, didn't he? Named for the Nightwing that Superman um, sometimes becomes in Candor. Uh, 
Um, warning, this is Olsen Island. Trespass at your own risk. Signed King, Ol J King James Olsen I. So you won't obey my royal command to keep off her, Superman? Well, this kryptonite will prove my willingness for real. Great Scott, ever since Jimmy inherited this island kingdom, he's turned against me and all his other friends. <laughs> he's fashioned a catapult to fire kryptonite at Superman to keep him away from his island. What kind of shenanigans are those? More kryptonite craziness here. This this covers really bad grade. It's got it's like it's got a tear halfway across the cover. A like really bad looking tear from there to there. I don't know if it's all the way through the book or what. Uh, thumbs down. Death to Superman. Tough luck, Superman. Luther and Brainiac want to save you, but they're outvoted. I'll have to kill you with this kryptonite. Convention of anti-Superman gang. The officers, Luke, Lex Luthor as chief, Cosmic King as crime commissioner, Saturn Queen as space raid, Lightning Law is in charge of espionage, and Brainiac's director of new crimes. Witness the execution of Superman in the arena of doom. And uh, Cosmic King is saying, death. Lex Luthor is saying, no, spare him. Brainiac says, mercy. And uh, Lightning Law says, bah, finish him off, Olsen. But as you can see, it's got a significant tear. Oh. Oh, youch. But yeah, obviously meant it cost me less. Oh, and it's, it's, is it, oh, it's stuck on one, it's on one staple, the staple which is right near the tear. So yeah. <laughs> Low grade's better than no grade. As a famous philosopher once said, I think it might have been Aristotle or uh, Plato who first coined that phrase. Could be wrong. Right, number 91. Listen, punk, start talking about the capers you and your motorcycle mob pulled or I'll pulverise you. You don't scare me, super thing. I'm no stoolie. Any cat who stands up to Superman is A-OK -okay with me. Let's sign Jimmy up for the dragons. Featuring Jimmy Olsen's most dangerous anti-crime role in The Dragon Delinquent. He's obviously going undercover to split up this motorcycle gang. Stop their crimes, the delinquent ways. Okay, number 112. At exactly noon, Superman will burst out of his box down below. He's the world's greatest escape artist. Lost all my superpowers hours ago. Can't breathe. I'll die within seconds. It's a pretty cool cover. It looks like he's in some kind of uh, German village. So I see Lederhosen in the background there. Interesting. Well, this is why I ended up getting this back to the next league. Because I knew, I discovered quite weirdly that there's another birthday book of Jimmy Olsen. Now, my birthday books, as far as I'm concerned, are books that are cover dated the month of my birth, so September 1969. Now, I already had Jimmy Olsen, I think it's 123, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 123, which is cover dated September 1969. But for some weird reason, the one prior to it, and 122, which is a giant, uh, six, 80 page giant, I think, has got September on the cover as well. And I think it's an accident, because in that year, you've got the July one, then you've got no August cover dated one, and you've got two September cover dated ones. So I think this one is meant to have been dated, cover dated as, as August, and they accidentally done it as September. So that's weird, isn't it? And I was not aware of that, and it's got stories in it. Many of them I've actually probably bought in the most recent batch of Jimmy's that I've got. So these are probably all going to be repeats, but you know, it's nice to have a, a giant Jimmy. Well, this one's in poor condition. Uh, call it Superman. This is only fiction I'm writing. Jimmy, a supernatural power is guiding your pen. Its terrible prediction about me will come true. I can't see what the, what the prediction says, but it's the pen of prophecy. There's a couple in lower grade, actually, that I, um, that I didn't fancy. I thought about it. I thought, nah. The price to the grade, I thought, I might be able to get a cheaper, better quality. Well, this is number 158, uh, more recent. Don't worry, Superman, Ultra Olsen will save you. 
and there he is smashing for the wall. I'm a bit going to look up this one as well actually. There's one here that's got like a little corner missing and because some of them, this one here, he had a few different ones. Yeah, I'm sure this is the one he had a couple of different ones and um, I'm pretty sure there was one that had a corner missing and one didn't have a corner missing and I bid on the one that never had a corner missing which was the same price. I think it was buy it now. No, it wasn't buy it now actually. No, it was bidding. So I wonder if he sent me the wrong one. But uh, I'm going to have to look that up and I'm going to make inquiries about the postage and see if I can get a fiver back or something. Because, yeah, I deserve it. <laughs> All right, anyway, cheers for watching. And, um, yeah, I'm out of here. I'll be back uh, tomorrow. I'll be doing um, Isle of the Dark conversation and chat with Rena Brown, the author, and my good pal uh, Matilda Goffica on, Mat on Matilda's channel. And hopefully I'll be having a conversation with Man Cave um, yeah, about his comic memories. So, yeah. Thursday I'll be going through one of my boxes, Box 30. I'll start going through Box 30 on Thursday. And hopefully I'll be doing a few Fallout streams here or there. But anyway, until you see me again, if you're missing me, you can always get some merch with my beautiful face on it. The link is down below. Get yourself a nice grey man mug. <laughs> or a t-shirt. Or a pair of knickers. <laughs> They're not really any knickers in there. There's a mini skirt though. You can get a nice mini skirt. Anyway, I'm out of here. Uh, cheers for tuning in. Until next time, have a great amazing day and may all your news be good news. <laughs>